After the headache of trying to find a shred of dignity in Breakpoint's initial design, and turning back to the first Advanced Warfighter to display my affection for its underappreciated gameplay, I thought I'd continue the trend of Ghost Recon consuming the focus of my content by revisiting a game I haven't touched since it released, and a game I believe to be one of the initial displays of Ubisoft's determination to use its IPs built around tactical realism to get an even larger foothold into the mainstream console market, by changing the beloved Tom Clancy IPs to follow in the same vein of the blockbusters that were killing it in the late 2000s and early 2010s, a trend that would consume Ubisoft and continue over the course of the next decade. Tom Clancy IPs like Splinter Cell and Rainbow Six started changing dramatically in these years, focusing more on rebranding and changing design aspects in favor of those that were trending at the time. This meant more accessible controls, game design that centered more so around instant gratification, and injecting an emphasis onto action into all of their titles. Even the ones that belonged to franchises where action was less of a selling point. Enter Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Future Soldier. A title that while sharing a lot of the selling points of past Ghost Recon entries, sheds all of the principal tactical game design that was their fundamental appeal in order to crank the adrenaline past Call of Duty and Battlefield levels. And I mean that without any exaggeration. This game embodies the essence of the phrase high speed. And not that high speed creeping through the shadows being swift and silent stuff, I'm talking literally sprinting 300 miles per hour through a war zone, holding off tanks, helicopters, and literal battalions of Russian Taliban cartel with a revolver bipodded sniper rifle with a muzzle flash larger than the sun fitted with magnetic scope and tracking incendiary rounds. This game is fucking throttled out on high octane shit like this that goes beyond the point of absurdity and makes 13 hours in Benghazi look like a fucking documentary. And while I'm adamant of the fact that this game probably killed traditional Ghost Recon, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't slightly entertained by it. I can't think of a game that revels in its cliched, futuristic military aesthetic as well as this one does. There's honestly a fair amount of charm wrapped up in all the digital tints of blue, exaggerated animations, and Michael Bay-esque gun battles. Looking back at this game in hindsight, this over-the-top persona can be appreciated a lot more than when I initially played it in 2012 on the Xbox 360, where cinematic blockbusters were a dime a dozen and already featured 6-9 hour campaigns of ultra-nationalist Russians and World War III scenarios. It's cliched right up to the brim, but that doesn't mean it's not worth the play. We're good to go, sir. Alright then, let's go get these sons of bitches that did this. Playing Future Soldier in 2020, there isn't necessarily an ideal version to play. The PC version which I played on is a lazy port of the 360 game and is among a couple other Ubisoft PC releases from its time that have the most ass backwards online functionality. The Xbox 360 version on the other hand has complete online functionality but with the obvious drawback of a lower resolution and an undesirable frame rate. I was pretty disappointed that I purchased this game for $35 on Uplay with the sole intent of playing the story mode cooperatively with a buddy, only to find that I wasn't even able to send a single game invite to him to get him into the same lobby as me. Troubleshooting this went on for about 2 hours or so as I exhausted all sorts of apparent workarounds that people had discovered on the internet. These ranged from opening specific ports on my router, setting up a DMZ, deleting all of my friends on Uplay, and re-adding the ones I wanted to play with which I felt like a fucking idiot for doing since that or any of the other solutions had any sort of effect. So kudos. Kudos for Ubisoft for doing the absolute bare minimum in keeping this game's online component alive. It's a common belief on the various game forms for Future Soldier that this problem stems from the PC version being a very simplistic port of the Xbox 360 version, and I see no reason why that wouldn't be the case. Future Soldier on the PC hasn't been optimized terribly well. It's absolutely required to turn the V-Sync option off to play this game properly, and some graphical options hiccup the frame rate into the mid-30s. Nothing that completely destroys the experience, but you can just tell that this PC version was rushed out the door as quick as possible. Evident by the Xbox 360 button prompts which still haven't been replaced. I get in 2012 that PC was less of a priority than the consoles, but you can't really forgive how some of the shit gets overlooked. Like, the left bumper icon, for instance, is literally visible at all times on your HUD. And to think that no one had enough fucks in a day to give to change this or at least bring attention to it is sort of shameful. The game randomly gives up in the menu screen at times, and attempting to play online will guarantee a crash. As I had no other choice but to play this game on my own, I found as long as I was in-game by myself, I didn't really have any issues. Outside of the worst screen tearing I've witnessed without v turned off in a while. 
Aside from these things, Future Soldier is a game that definitely got a lot out of the 360 it would seem. Making the game into a more linear experience than Advanced Warfighter 2 clearly came with the benefit of the developers being able to cram in a lot more detail into the environments. If one thing is for certain, it's that Future Soldier is glazed with atmosphere. Whether you're assaulting a snowed in base, infiltrating a compound on a rainy night, or sneaking through the woods, each level fits the mood for what you're doing with some very well crafted lighting and weather effects. I was surprised by, well, how cool the magnetic filter looked, and the unique aesthetic it gives to the gameplay, sort of giving everything a virtual simulation kind of vibe. Kill well, this might be easier than we thought. Future Soldier comes packed with three separate modes. Multiplayer, which obviously I can't talk about. Gorilla, which is Ghost Recon's take on Horde mode. And the campaign, which is going to be the sole focus of this video. I'll start off by saying that this game's first couple levels give a very poor impression of its potential, as the level design is in such a way that fails to give the player much agency outside of taking cover and shooting enemies in courtyard sized arenas. Now pathways and scripted set pieces that break up the firefights in this first level can give you a realistic idea about how much substance the gameplay actually holds. Enemies have some of the most generous hitboxes out of any shooter I've played in a minute, and with how quick and agile the gun mechanics are, there's hardly much depth to enemy encounters even on higher difficulties. Pairing really quick kill times like this with small arenas that don't offer any room for player movement trains your intuition to prioritize aiming and shooting only, but not other factors that are supposed to give depth to other shooting games. Positioning and prioritizing targets is generally not required since your weapon practically sprays laser beams, making dispatching enemies feel very insignificant unless you're killing them rapidly and in large groups meaning the only form of subsidiary objective in combat can be summed up by how quickly you can shoot your way through an area without getting killed. I find this unfortunate, because when a shooter's combat cycle is as lightning fast as this game, there's not much else to keep you entertained unless the arenas are packed full of enemies. Hence why it works so well in Call of Duty. The primary problem I have with this more arcadey take on combat is that engagements with enemies feel like they're just getting started when they've actually finished. These annoying ass door breaching animations, slow motion breaches ripped straight from Modern Warfare 2, and on rail set pieces don't help this game's pacing in this regard. Future Soldier is full of this stuff that sure, makes for interesting stuff to watch, but ultimately detracts from the gameplay. You've already witnessed the entire bag of tricks by the end of this very first level, where you're forced to endure a finale that is up there as one of the most over the top on rail segments I've ever played. The squad of ghosts have to escort a VIP through a war zone, and you don't have anything to do but watch and click as the camera shakes and swerves following your character, who is literally moving at a snail's pace, holding his pistol like Denzel Washington in Training Day while mowing down battalions of goons with Robocop accuracy and a bottomless magazine. There is no denying the production value on screen here. This is entertaining to watch, but not at all to play. It's very familiar stuff if you've ever played a modern shooter, and it doesn't have an ounce of originality. Luckily, these things become less frequent as the game goes on and as the levels end up eventually cutting you loose, but it takes a couple of missions for the game to arrive here. It's in these later missions where arenas provide more flexibility for flanking and alternative tactics altogether. As well, enemy volume is bumped up significantly, which gives a welcoming addition to the difficulty. The lightning fast gunplay started to shine for me as enemy counts began to raise and gadgets and vehicles were thrown into the mix. Finally, the game was beginning to become fun because my positions were being challenged and taking advantage of the cover system became a requirement. Take into account that Future Soldier's damage model isn't as unforgiving as prior entries, you can still die quickly enough for sticking your head out of cover longer than a couple seconds. Luckily animations are very quick, so peeking in and out of cover works like a charm. And since target acquisition is a breeze considering engagements hardly take place at distances exceeding 50 meters, Future Soldier's formula requires aggression and speedy reflexes. When the combat is fired up on all cylinders, with enemies coming at you from all sorts of different angles, Future Soldier begins to shine. Bolts will be flying everywhere and you'll be killing enemies by the dozens at distances that hardly ever require you to exercise proper trigger control. It's a frantic, twitchy experience with some memorable highs but highs that are unfortunately short-lived. The stealth component on the other hand it doesn't do too much to entice when you plan your own. This is your typical two methods of takedowns, predictable vision bubbles that are fitted with detection meters, style of stealth that has become a trademark of Ubisoft game design. And while I have criticisms of it already, Future Soldier has three very limiting factors that make this formula feel even more played out than it already is. 
and it makes stealth segments feel like they should have a skip option. Similar to the turret sections and quick time events, stealth does help by providing variation in the levels, but they do a lot more to hinder the experience in my opinion. I found stealth to be profoundly boring unless it was taken in small bites, and especially frustrating when they triggered a restart to the last checkpoint, which they often did. The first issue can be summed up to the application of the cloaking ability. Since your character is fitted with a cloak suit which automatically activates when you're prone or completely still, it's hardly an inconvenience when you've been caught in a bad position pending detection from an unalerted enemy, as they will just ignore you after you stop moving for a couple of moments as your cloak fills back up. Regardless of lighting, weather, or even distance, if you just lie down, you're golden. It creates sort of the opposite problem some games have with stealth, where you can be unfairly detected. Future Soldier's stealth, on the other hand, is so awkwardly simplistic that any challenge is voided by how cloaking seems to be the only method of becoming unseen, aside from taking cover. And it actually ends up becoming a serious detriment to the pacing in areas made for stealth. Since, regardless of how low you are, you will be spotted unless you're in cover or in camo, which will lead you to awkwardly shifting movement speeds between crouching, crawling, and stopping for cloak. For me, this made one area with limited cover and an ATV frustrating to the point where I had to turn the game off for the night, as the only way I could get past it was to roll camo roll camo. In one of the behind the scenes videos for Future Soldier, a Ubisoft Paris developer describes co-op mode being far more difficult than solo when it comes to stealth tactics as the friendly AI are not susceptible to any failure in terms of stealth, and the application of the sync shot feature confirms this to be true. Problem number two that I have with this game's stealth is that it lets you tag enemies for your teammates to simultaneously shoot, and it makes Splinter Cell's Convictions similar use of the same feature feel like even more of an unbalanced tool. Getting your teammates to clear out groups of up to four makes these stealth segments almost easy to the point where any sense of achievement is snuffed out completely from the generic Ubisoft stealth formula especially considering how there isn't a cooldown for how frequently you can use this feature. It can turn these segments into a game of waiting for pairs or couples to be gathered together far enough away from each other in order for you to take them out as groups. It certainly is a cool feature in the way it's presented and sounds like it works way better in co-op, but it can be way too easily exploited in solo play, and turns what is supposed to be a tension-filled alternative to gunning and running, a game of taking enemies that sucks the fun out of traditional singular stealth. The third reason why Future Soldier's stealth takes away from the experience is that the majority of these segments are failure upon detection, amplifying the previous problems that affect the pacing. You have no choice but to slow the brakes to a point that feels like too much of a contrast from the high intensity gunfights. You go from controlling your soldier with speedy animations and movement, only to be halted and forced to move at a snail's pace, unable to find a happy medium that feels natural. I often felt forced into finding the order of inputs that were intended by the developers to clear an area undetected. This honestly made these segments test my patience as I'd be waiting for enemies patrolling to break the line of sight from their comrades so I could take them out, which can feel like hours especially when you've just stepped off the adrenaline bus of future soldiers overt engagements. I think conviction style of stealth would have suited this game a lot better as it complements more aggressive playstyles while retaining an emphasis on avoidance but not to the point where the game punishes you with a game over screen. Either that or removing the failure screens altogether and instead inserting a challenge as a form of consequence, like reinforcements or a harder enemy type, instead of making the player continue to trial and error. Something I think people fondly remember Future Soldier for is a little feature called the Gunsmith and I'd probably be doing this game a disservice if I didn't at least bring it up. In this screen, you'll get to completely customize your weapons prior to missions, and at the time of release, this was probably the most in-depth weapon customization at the time. You can completely disassemble your weapon and customize up to 12 different aspects of it, from barrels to sights to stocks and even gas systems. It isn't necessarily Tarkov levels of customization, but it gives a really great sense of personalization and tactical consideration that was unmatched at the time. And among all of the Ghost Recon games, even up to Breakpoint, it remains a feature exclusive just to Future Soldier. But I will note that the variations of attachments and barrels don't affect the gunplay as much as I'd like. In my experience, I found whether my gun had a short barrel with a silencer and vertical grip attachments that were supposedly detriment to decreasing my weapon's accuracy and range, it was still more than suitable for targets at even more extreme distances, and I failed to notice much of a difference. 
I feel like this has to do with how generous the enemy hitboxes are, and how playing with a mouse makes precise shooting far more easier than a controller, which this game was built around first. Something I really appreciated is how before entering the gunsmith, your squad leader will give you a specific recommendation to what style of weapon you should equip for the mission. You'll be moving from open woods into tight spaces in town, which means two sets of engagement ranges. Once you get up a nice touch that remedied something I found to be an issue in Gra's original campaign, where there was never a clue what type of weapon setup would be the most optimal for your next objective. In terms of the weapons themselves, there were some aesthetic choices that really bothered me. For instance, some weapon models I found very repulsive, like how the AK-47 has two postings of iron sights, which is so distracting I'm not even focusing on what I'm shooting at in this frame. And muzzle flashes are so absurdly exaggerated, I actually can't see what I'm shooting at in this frame. Turn it down a bit. And lastly, we get to the story. I don't think I'm being overly critical by saying that stories in Tom Clancy games outside of Splinter Cell have hardly ever been very memorable, sort of ironically. And Future Soldier isn't much different in that regard, but it definitely gets some brownie points for at least attempting to give its soldiers distinct personalities, and by developing a story that is presented far more cinematically than prior games. In between missions, you're treated to a little bit of character development of your squad members. There is the team leader who's always on the phone trying to get some time in with the son, the stereotypical Southern sniper guy whose only purpose it seems is to give comic relief and complain about whatever you're doing, and then there's Kozak who's defaulted as player one, and he's just as street edged as Mitchell with the same amount of unhinged aggression. Awesome work on that bridge, Captain. And the way you took out those artillery pieces. Private, can you do me a favor? Yes, sir. Can the chatter and put your foot to the floor. And then there's this guy, his name is Pepper, and honestly, I can't even tell you what his stick is. But aside from all that, they really aren't very flushed out. If they didn't have as distinct voices as they did, it would virtually be impossible to tell who was talking during gameplay, as the writing hardly does anything to distinguish them. Most of the dialogue is your typical grunt banter you hear in any other type of war game. And unlike a game like Bad Company 2, which follows a four-man squad of soldiers on a similarly structured campaign, their personalities, aside from maybe Southern Sniper Guy, don't really contrast with one another's. It took a couple missions for me to actually figure out who was who with their masks on in-game. Aside from your squad mates, Mitchell, who makes a return, is basically the only other character of any significance. Now a major, he assumes the role of commander of the Ghost, giving your squad mission briefs and directives through the radio. But he hardly really gets involved in the story outside of giving you stuff to do and apologizing for constantly sending you on missions. I will say I appreciate the very little effort the game takes to humanize the Ghost, as it does give the story a bit more character than past games. But it definitely isn't my favorite story in the series, as it really is just background noise for the gameplay and only serves the purpose of setting up a global campaign. The actual plot failed to grab my interest, and I hardly had much clue of what was going on by the time the credits rolled, despite watching all the cutscenes and briefs. And I'll try to summarize why in a moment, but first I'll try to give a synopsis of what happens just from my own recollection to sort of drive in the point of how memorable the story is. At the beginning of the game, a ghost squad is killed by a dirty bomb, and Mitchell sends your team of ghosts to track down an arms dealer that has intel on who supplied it. From there on, you follow lead after lead that takes you on a worldwide escapade of killing all sorts of nameless bad dudes of various ethnicities to track down who killed your buddies. Eventually, you figure out that there is a rebel group or PMC involved with the intent to start a coup in what country I honestly forgot, but upon looking at Wikipedia, I found out that it was Russia, and you spend a couple missions destabilizing their efforts. Eventually, you ensure that the coup fails, and this leads you to some Russian dudes in suits who were pulling the strings all along. This leads you to this last part that has you in Russia taking them out, of which the conclusion is this really confusing scene where the game's main antagonist who was only introduced in this last mission you were given the order to kill implies that he cannot be touched because of forces inside the US government that will protect him. This is then confirmed by Mitchell coming over the radio and ordering your ghost squad to belay the prior order of killing him. Kozak gets really pissed at this and the squad decides to leave the balding suit dude to get run over by the train technically still following orders as they were told not to touch him. I have no idea of what any of this was meant to apply or how it really connected to what you've done in the last 11 missions. It kind of felt like it came out of nowhere. It seems like there was like an internal conspiracy that they wanted to give more time to flush out but they never got around to it. There's a lot of reasons I could attribute to why the story is so boring. 
But to summarize, Future Soldier's story just has far too much exposition to the point where it's really hard to get invested into the conflict. The stakes just aren't communicated in a very natural way. I bet if you do pay attention to the briefs hard enough, you can line up the dots, but I never got to the point of caring. Not to say that Gra's story is anything stellar, cause it isn't, but it did just enough in the story department to make you comprehend the gravity of what you were doing, even though the way it was told was entirely through your heads up display. In Future Soldier, I just couldn't grab onto it, and it felt like a wasted opportunity considering how there was an obvious desire to make this a far more cinematic campaign. Hey. Oh man, <laughs> you must be pissed. Come all the way over here and the locals end up doing all the shooting for you, huh? <laughs> Business as usual. Future Soldier released at the tail end of the copycat modern military shooting trend that was gigantic in the early 2010s. And despite this, it didn't do that bad financially, however it quickly became forgotten. Whether it be due to its more casual yet rapid approach to combat than its predecessors, or its abundance of on-rail set pieces, critically it was pretty clear that not much of what it offered couldn't already be found in other games at the time, especially in 2012 where other franchises already had taken their shot at copying the Modern Warfare template to varying degrees of success, by the time Future Soldier came around, the magic behind explosive Hollywood military shooters already fizzled out, and this was nothing that its futuristic aesthetic, gunsmith, or co-op could honestly compensate for. With how much verity can be found in the AAA space of gaming today, playing Ghost Recon Future Soldier years later definitely feels like stepping into a time capsule. As refreshing as it was to play through it again, it didn't take long for me to be reminded about why the Call of Duty formula was, and still is, considered a plague. Future Soldier's core gameplay built around quick kill times and frantic gunplay is competent and somewhat unique, but it's hardly enough to make me want to come back to it anytime soon. It certainly has a unique aesthetic and some original gimmicks to complement its core, but at least when I played this game solo, it wasn't enough for me to justify keeping it installed. As already mentioned, I can't speak to the quality of the game in terms of co-op, and it's a damn shame because it's obvious that that's what this game was built around. But playing this game in solo, I can safely say it's not a very deep experience, and the mileage you'll get from playing it lasts just as long as the campaign does, which is about 8-10 to 10 hours depending on the difficulty. As high speed as this game is, its execution on the gameplay is weighed down by slow, unengaging stealth sequences, arenas that don't do enough to satisfy, and on-rail set pieces that take you out of the moment. The adrenaline-packed highs are outnumbered by sequences that expect the presentation to carry most of the weight of what you're doing. Pair this with the technical issues of playing it on PC, it takes somebody with a very specific itch for a game like this in order for me to recommend them buying it at its listed price. But if you're in the mood for style over substance gameplay with what I think is a sleek military aesthetic and lightning fast third person cover based shooting, just maybe you'd consider adding Future Soldier to your library.